with that, we'll get started with our speaker, Dr. Dave Franzen. Hopefully I didn't butcher that name, North Dakota State University Soil Specialist. He's going to be talking about biologicals and their role in soil fertility. I'm really excited to hear what he has to say. That's a, a big buzzword right now in agriculture, all the soil biologicals that are out there. And uh, Dave has uh, done some research on that and has gathered research from several other land grant universities and uh, has got some information on that that he's going to share with us. And let me see that. Oops, sorry. And with that, um, I'll turn it over to Dave. Okay, real good. So I'm going to share my screen. And here I am. And this worked this morning, so surely it'll work now. Here we go from the beginning. Are we good? That looks good. All right, here we go. So you see the title is a little bit different than the introduction. So I've narrowed it down onto the, the commercial asymbiotic nitrogen fixing organisms. Uh, and then I have some suggestions for you to ask people that may be selling, marketing, uh, researching these products. Uh, and it, just because I'm zeroed in on the asymbiotic organisms doesn't mean that the same principles couldn't, couldn't be applied to any biological. So here we go. So there's about six points that I really want to make uh, during the presentation. And the first one is that Asymbiotic nitrogen fixing organisms are a natural part of our soils. They're, they're in all the soils. Every farm that you have, every field you have, has some of these active in it. They work at different capacities depending on what your tillage regime is and the environmental conditions. And I'll explain that as we go along. Uh, asymbiotic nitrogen fixing organisms are usually a bacteria. Uh, and they have the ability to fix atmospheric N uh, into gas and transform it into ammonia. Uh, they immediately put it into some kind of a carbon skeleton so they don't burn the cell up. Uh, and it's a process that re requires energy. And the big thing with these is it's not attached to a living plant. It's symbiotic nitrogen fixers, you you know what they are. They're the, they're the nodules. They produce the nodules on the soybean roots and the peas and whatever kind of annual legumes and even alfalfa and clovers. That, that's what they are. They're, they're symbiosis. Uh, but uh, asymbiotic are just free living in the soil. So I think there's some misconception that these were invented last Tuesday, maybe a couple years ago, and they, and they weren't. These things are some of the oldest organisms on Earth. There's uh, evidence for them uh, as far back as one and a half billion years ago. And this is remarkable considering that symbiotic nitrogen fixers, the ones that produce the nodules on the roots, uh, were only appeared maybe 60 million, 59 million years ago. So it's pretty energy intensive. So what do I mean by that? So the N2 bond is a triple bond, and it takes a lot of energy in order to break that, to convert one molecule of N2 gas into one molecule or two molecules of ammonia requires 16 ATP. What are those? Those are, that's the, that's some of, not all of, but it's, it's the, probably the main energy, chemical energy organism, uh, not organism, the compound within the plant. So during photosynthesis, the the end product of it is, is to produce uh, adenosine triphosphate from adenosine diphosphate. And then during the chemical reaction, it goes from adenosine triphosphate to adenosine diphosphate. And that's the energy required to uh, make certain processes happen in a plant. And so it, it requires 16 of those. And to put that in perspective, another very energy intensive uh, reaction is a production of a peptide bond. That means that in, if you have one amino acid and you're trying to link it to another amino acid uh, to make a protein, uh, it takes uh, five, five ATPs. So it takes over three times that to, to convert. So it's not a trivial thing and energy limits nitrogen fixation. So there's the nitrogenase enzyme. It's a very simple enzyme really. Uh, 
I'm, a lot of enzymes are way more complicated than that. And I, and I think it's remarkable that there's seven irons. Uh, this, the line formula is in the bottom. There's seven irons in it, and that's unusual because most enzymes that we that I've that I've run into contact with maybe have one metal ion, maybe two, but but seven's un unbelievable. But a billion and a half years ago, when these when this enzyme had to have been developed, uh, there was no oxygen in the atmosphere, and so iron was freely soluble, uh, just like iron in your groundwater. You know that it's you can dissolve a lot of iron in the groundwater as long as there's no oxygen around, and as soon as you lift that water up to the surface and put it in a horse tank it immediately becomes a trillion times less soluble and that's why you get the orange in the or in the in the horse tank anyway so at the time where where this enzyme was developed uh there was iron all over the place and so the the nerd in me uh finds it fascinating uh and that's probably why there's seven iron in it, because there was plenty of iron soluble at the time. All right, so enough nerd. Let's go back to the what we're really talking about here. So what are the energy sources? An energy source in a symbiotic relationship is, is directly the carbohydrates that come from the plant. Uh, but these are not attached to a plant, so they have to get their energy from someplace else. One of the main places where they find a food source is in the slime around a root. If you pull up a root and feel it, it, it feels wet, but it's not water, it's a, it's a slime, it's a organic liquid substance. Uh, all roots leak, uh, and the, around that leakage is the area that we call the rhizosphere, and we call it that because there are many, many things that are alive in that immediate root zone. Thousands of organisms colonize that root root zone, that slime, as if you will. So this is this is a major food source. A 200 bushel corn crop might spit out a uh, leak, maybe thousand pounds of of carbohydrates out of the root. We don't think of roots being that leaky, but they really, really are. Uh, also, another possible food source would be organic matter or residues that haven't decayed all the way. Those intermediate compounds within a bulk soil. Uh, another weird thing about uh, asymbiotic nitrogen fixers is that there are some products that are actually sprayed on the plant tissue and the organisms apparently are working inside of the plant. And, and that's just odd uh, to me. It's odd. I, I know that sugar, sugar cane does this all the time, but it, in, it's not really symbiotic, but but this relationship has evolved over a while. So again, it didn't happen last week, uh, but these new sprayed on things are, are pretty new. And so they have to get energy too. And so if they're consuming carbohydrate from the plant, then that's carbohydrate that can't go into anything else. And so it's just kind of odd to me that somebody would make a, produce a, a manufacture an, an organism in, in, in this way, but I don't know, time will tell, maybe this is the way it should go. All right, so root exudates. These are pictures of root exudates. This comes from a, a 2017 publication. They did some really nice work. Uh, the arrows point to roots that are covered in stuff, and that stuff is the root exudates. And lots and lots of organisms live on that stuff, on that uh, exudate. A symbiotic bacteria. There are many of them. So I was just in a little bit of a search. A while back, I, I stumbled across a China, Chinese paper from a Tibet soil, uh, and in their soil samples, they found back, uh, asymbiotic bacteria that originated from five, six phyla, 13 classes, 43 genera, and then numerous species after that. Uh, the genera come from all kinds of things. Some of these may be familiar to you, and some of them certainly were not familiar to me, and there's many, many more, a host of others, as they say. Uh, there are many species, and it's no surprise to me that every chemical company known to man is is uh, trying to isolate one of these bacteria and put it in a container because there's plenty to go around. There's all kinds of these things out there. So one of the things I found was that, that tillage makes a big difference on the activity of these, the magnitude of the activity. And I, I did a search earlier uh, before I published my paper, and I couldn't really find any references where people had really worked on that. And then 
I used non-symbiotic instead of asymbiotic and found that my my retired colleague, John Lamb, when he was a PhD student at University of Nebraska with uh, Gary Peterson, and oh, I can't remember if it's John John Duran or Jim Duran. Anyway, they published a paper in 87 that showed the same thing I did. They they kind of discounted the, the differences between no-till and in conventional till, considering that wasn't enough to really make much difference, but they considered it a... a um, quantitative study and I, I never did I always think of it qualitative there's no way to really measure this in the field uh, and so you have to extract the soil and then ship it someplace else so you could do a, a settling settling reduction reaction settling as a triple bond too and so the bacteria work on the triple bond of a settling just like it would triple bond of nitrogen and so that's why it's a proxy to give you kind of a general general idea so this is the assay that that my colleague used when they were working with mine. But consider that when you take a take, you're in a no-till environment, you have these organisms that are established in these little cubby holes, these little tiny, teeny, tiny spaces. They've, they've uh, produced a community, uh, they're all living together, they have a food source nearby, they're safely comfortable in their homes, and all of a sudden an agronomist comes by with a, with a trowel and and lifts it out of the ground, and all of a sudden you can, you know, if you hear, listen really closely, you can hear a trillion souls all crying out together and then suddenly silenced. So you're disturbing the environment where these are in. You're putting it in a container, you're shipping it, in my case, all the way down to Florida, uh, and then they're handling it and then putting it in an incubation. So, so, so yeah, any differences you see are qualitative. It's certainly not what's actually going on in the field. What's actually going on in the field is many times, many, many times more than what you're seeing in the incubation, just because of the, you've disturbed the environment. All right, so in North Dakota, uh, I'm the only person in the world uh, that uh, has published a long-term no-till nitrogen credit for several crops. Uh, and there's many reasons for this, but uh, I'll give you the background story. So I came here June 13th, 1994, and that that winter I was invited to give a presentation at the Manitoba, North Dakota Zero Till Conference in Minot, just in the north central part of the state. So I did, and uh, I remember it because of two things. One is I woke up the next morning, it was the coldest I've ever been in my life before or since. It was 45 below, and that's not wind chill, that was actual temperature. So I remember it because of that, uh, but I also remember it because the night before, the committee had asked me up to an upper room for a beverage. And so I went, and I got to talk to a lot of the original no-tillers in the state. No-till in the state was pretty much farmer-driven. Uh, and went across the grain from USDA and extension beliefs at the time. Uh, but some of them uh, in 95 had been in no-till for at least 20 years. And so I got to I got to meet a lot of them, and I got to talk to a lot of them. And so I just absorbed a lot of stuff. The North Dakota people told me that they were happy to see me. Uh, but then in, in the next breath, they told me that they didn't follow NDSU nitrogen recommendations anymore. And I asked them why. And they said, well, after they've been in no-till for a while, they found they could shave their nitrogen rate. And they'd shaved it enough after all these years that it didn't resemble NDSU recommendations anymore. So they just didn't pay attention to it. And I said, okay, I'm from Illinois. What do I know? But then I remembered it. And... And uh, over time, after I got done with my zone sampling stuff uh, in the early 2000s, I started working on the the recommendations because the recommendations didn't support the new site-specific sampling at all. Uh, and so I'd gathered well over 100 site years of in-rate data on spring wheat in Durham across the state. And I remember the conversation. I split it out in between long-term no-till, six years or more continuous, and conventional till, and they were right. And it took 50 pounds less nitrogen to make at least the same wheat crop and at least the same protein as a conventional till. And I tested it in corn, and it was the same. And I tested it in sunflowers, and it was the same. And most recently on two-row malting barley, and that's the same. And I think that, well, you know, I'm pretty sure that part of it is because when you apply ammonium fertilizer, uh, microorganisms take that up. They're not so crazy about nitrate, but they love ammonia uh, fertilizer. So 
So they'll take that up and there's way more microorganisms and way more kinds of microorganisms in long-term no-till than there in this conventional till. So I think that's part of the credit is this, they have short, short lifespans, they, they, they take up ammonia, they live, they die, they rot, they ooze, and, and ammonia is taken up by others or might be by the crop. I, I think it's kind of a slow release biological fertilizer. But the other part of it uh, is because of the activity of asymbiotic nitrogen organisms. And that idea came for me from a question in the Minnesota audience about 15 years ago or so when I was talking about this credit, because they don't have one in Minnesota either. Uh, so I poo-pooed it at the time, and I thought, well, I'd read the literature. It amounts to maybe 5, 10 pounds of nitrogen per acre per year. Um, but I didn't think it was any big deal. Um, it's part of that reason why if you don't put any nitrogen fertilizer on a field, you never get zero yield. Uh, there's always nitrogen that comes from the soil, which is the reason I hate yield-based formulas, because they totally discount the totally discount the the production of nitrogen uh, from from the soil so anyway but so then i started to look at it i went out a few years ago and i took paired sampling uh i talked to talked to a number of farmers across the state and there were a few of them of uh, 14 of them 13 14 that 13 that had what they considered a conventional till across the fence so I went out to their site, took a sample for the asymbiotic uh, assay uh, from their field and then right across the fence, right across the road, similar soil uh, in their neighbor that was conventional till. And the results were in that square there. So uh, this is that little dotted line that, that goes from top to bottom in the middle there. That's where conventional till equals no till. Uh, and then anything to the right of that is where no-till the activity is way greater than, than conventional till. And the farther to the right you are on that rectangle, that, that square, the the more the more difference there is. So those two in the middle, the ones where conventional till equals no-till, uh, the farmer, the no-till farmer, thought that those were conventional till, but it's really, uh, on further examination, those are very shallow one-pass seedings, which to bi biological, they go into the same pot of the nitrogen credit. And so conventional till equals no till as far as asymbiotic bacteria goes and that should be pretty intuitive so so yeah so i have a paper on that and so my next project was how does the activity change through the season if you look at nitrogen mineralization uh organisms uh they're they're usually front loaded up into the at least in the north dakota climate certainly different in kansas but it's it's earlier in the spring uh, and so I wondered if this would be the same way. And so I looked at it uh, under the under the context of how does moisture affect it? How does temperature affect it? And so the graph on the left shows that as the as the the amount of rainfall within thirty days of sampling increases the amount of activity samples. I had six locations in the eastern part of the state. I sampled them from from thaw, from spring thaw. Uh, all the way to harvest. So it was maybe late April to mid-September or so. So each of those dots represents a sampling date and the mean rainfall in centimeters, and you want to divide that by two and a half to get inches, uh, is the is the accumulative 30-day rainfall before that date. And then the so as, as the moisture increases, the activity increases. And then the chart on the right shows that as the temperature increases, the activity increases. So they're very, very related and very, very sensitive to changes in moisture and changes in temperature. So how's it vary through the season? Uh, this is just an example. Jamestown's about 100 miles west of Fargo. Uh, and most of the activity occurs in our state between, oh, middle of June, middle of June, and about the first part of July. And and that's when the, the moisture is probably maximized in most years, uh, and the temperature is warm. When it starts to dry out there in July, when the crop has taken up a lot of moisture, the activity goes down. In a drought year, uh, that that picture there in 21 is, is a relatively moist year, not too wet, not too dry. But in moist years, you still have that same pattern, but the magnitude of 
of those numbers was a lot lower, like a tenth. They were a tenth what those numbers are. So the chart on the right is from a site just north of, of Fargo. It's a very high clay soil, at least 50% clay. And uh, a couple days before I arrived to take my monthly sample, it rained two inches. And these these soils, the movement downward of water is only about a third of an inch a day. Uh, so the the site that I sampled wasn't flooded, but it was certainly very wet. And I had to take my shoes off and wade out into the field in order to take the samples. So this, the clay is very sticky, really sticky. Anyway, so you can see that from that dip that it doesn't like saturated conditions at all either. So yeah, uh, as moisture grow, uh, increases, the activity goes, but as soon as it gets saturated, uh, they go dormant or die or something. So this is what we know about native activity based on those studies. It's greater than in long-term no-till than conventional till, and it's greater than moist soil and warm conditions, and they're very, very sensitive to moisture and, and temperature. So that's what we know. So enter the commercial products. I'm on a agricultural experiment station committee. Uh, the, the, the AES, the agricultural experiment station has number of regional committees across the across the country. And we're in the north central region along with Kansas. Uh, Dorivar is our representative on that committee uh, and I'm the North Dakota representative. And so we meet every November after a conference in Des Moines and in fall of 2021 we met. And the chatter is all about these organisms. And so a couple of the people in the room had already done a little bit of exploratory work on a couple project products, but most of the people in the room were going to do some the next year. And so we agreed as a group that we would uh, finish our work and then share our results. And then I volunteered to put everything together and I volunteered NDSU to publish it. And so that's what we did. So in fall in 22, uh, we gathered again, uh, we shared our information uh, from there until about the first of the year, and then about March or so, uh, I came out with, uh, with the circular. I had it reviewed by everybody that was on the committee that everybody shared uh, to make sure I didn't misrepresent anything, and, and so away it went. And apparently it went viral in the biological community, at least that's what they told me. So this is a summary. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna bore you with the results from each of the studies. The if you go to Dave France and NDSU and then scroll down the page until you hit extension publications and then hit that and then look for something that starts with asymbiotic, uh, you'll come up with everything. It'll have a, uh, the methods that were used, the figures that are in there. Uh, for each of the states that was in the study. And there were 10 states that uh, contributed or that I gleaned. Aside from Kansas, uh, Dorovar was on um, uh, sabbatic leave somewhere close to Mars, and I couldn't get a hold of him. So I um, I gleaned a, a study that was in the Kansas, Kansas annual reports and stuck that in there. Uh, so there are 10 states that had, had data, and uh, at least related to corn. And so to summarize it all, there were 20, 54 total corn experiments on the products, and then 52 there was no benefit to yield over use of end rate alone uh, without the product. And then there were two sites, one in Missouri and one in Minnesota, where there were some benefits uh, of using a product. Uh, and if you went back through and to the nitrogen rate to versus yield equation, the value of those products was somewhere in the neighborhood of 12, 12 to 20 pounds of end per acre. So, so the frequency of positive results across 10 states is very low. And let's just leave it at that. So what should you take from that? I think it's really important for growers uh, to be very, to be curious about new products. The, the researchers on my committee were certainly curious and, and that's why we decided to do it because we, we kind of hoped that they would be a value because a lot of farmers put on more nitrogen than what they needed. And so maybe this would help. But um, but we put out replicated trials and a farmer, if they're curious about something, they need to try them on replicated strip trials on the farm itself. 
So recently, we just stole a a, a person from from K State. Uh, his name is Carlos Perez, and uh, my understanding is that he kind of started a non-farm network uh, in Kansas. Uh, the more most established on-farm network out of an extension program that I know of is Laura Thompson's from Nebraska. So I'm just going to talk about that. Uh, I would refer you uh, first to her paper, uh, that same conference that that uh, met before my committee met, uh, we asked her to provide some direction on on farm research. So, so she has a nice paper in the proceedings. And you can Google this and, and it's free, you don't have to be a member of anything in order to pick this up. So she has some nice ideas on how to set things up. Uh, this is what the paper looks like. Uh, and then here's some examples from the Thompson paper. So in the upper right, or I mean, upper left, there's a one, two, three, four uh, replications of different nitrogen rates. I can't imagine many farmers doing that kind of thing, but I imagine there may be some that would want to do that. But what we're talking about here is just using a product with and using a product without. Um, at least two replications, three is better. The more reps you have, the more power there is in the in confidence uh, in the results of the of the study. So that's that's from the paper, but this is really, really helpful. So if you go to their website, which is cropwatch.unl.edu <clears throat> and uh, and put in farmstat or or just put in uh, on farm research, you're going to get a whole uh, several really, really good uh, guides and instructions. Uh, they have YouTubes on how to set up a strip trial, replicated strip trial in the field. And then uh, one of the one of the greatest things I think they have in there is is a little thing called Farmstat, and and that's free. Again, uh, you have to put in some what your name and an email address and a couple things, but uh, I assure you they're not going to try to call you up and and sell you Medicare insurance or uh, siting or something like that. Uh, it's just so that they can figure out who's who's using their uh, data, uh, not data, but using their tools and uh, how they might uh, improve things over time. Th this is the easiest statistical program that you'll ever find. You can you can have your five-year-old run it, which I mean, isn't much of a stretch. You know, most, most people, if they have trouble with their cell phone, they give it to their five-year-old and their five-year-old can figure it out. But even even more than that, I think your your eighty five year old mother in law could probably figure out this too. It's really 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 easy. So they have YouTube's on how to set strip trials up, uh, and then uh, they have a YouTube on how to input data into this FarmStat program uh, and what to click and and when and and it spits out data, it spits out whether it's significant or not, whether what you're really seeing is a real difference or if it's just random chance. It's a it's a really powerful tool, so I strongly strongly recommend that people do this. So um, I think that farmers have GPS, and I think farmers have GPS yield monitors. So I think farmers have everything they need to replicate treatments and to test products effectively. And this is a great time for those questions, the poll questions. So the first poll question is, do you or do your custom applicator have GPS on your application equipment? So yes or no. Okay, folks who are joining on YouTube, this question is um, in the chat box. I'll read it to you again. Do you or your custom applicators have GPS on your application equipment? The choices are yes or no. Um, from what I can see, we've got 30, 34 Folks who have responded will give you just a couple more seconds to get your answers in. Okay, Dave, I'm going to end the poll on that. Okay, can you see the results now, Dave, or not? No, I can't. Okay, let I'm... me see if I can share them. There, there we go. There it okay. is. All right, so I was right. I mean, there's a couple people that don't, but most people do. And so that's not an excuse anymore. Okay, let's go to poll number two. Okay, poll number two. So do you have a DP GPS connected yield monitor? Yes or no? 
answers are flying and we're, we've got them in the routine now. <laughs> okay, folks who are on YouTube, the question is, do you have a GPS connected yield monitor? Okay, we'll go ahead and end the poll here and share the results. Okay, I'm not surprised. A few less have, have the yield monitor capability, but quite a few do. So for you that do, that's not an excuse not to do this either. So we'll poll number three. Okay, poll number three is up. Question so, is, have you conducted replicated strip trials in the past? So the question is, have you conducted replicated strip trials in the past? The moment I've got 27, 28 folks, I've got answers rolling in here. Okay, it looks like we're slowed down. So we'll end the poll and share the results here. Wow, that's more than what I thought. And Dave, when we talk about replicated, we're not just saying one versus another, correct? We're saying multiple replicates yeah. of that. So, so, I'll, so I'll give you the horrible ways to test products. All right, these are two horrible ways to test products. One is to put it on one field and not put it on another. That's not an experiment. That's just an observation. And whatever you find next year might be totally different. It's, yeah. And then the second uh, horrible way to do it is to uh, put it on one half of the field and don't put it on the other. I I tell people that if I stood at the on the roadside and threw a rock on one half of the field and didn't throw a rock on the other half, the fifty percent of the time the the half of the field that I threw the rock would be higher yielding than the other half. That's not an experiment either. So it has to be at least two with withouts, more if you can, but at least two uh, within the same field. That's that's the way to do it. If you do that, then you'll be able to run statistics. And, it, and statistics were developed because of the frustration with uh, with observations. Uh, every land grant in the whole country, uh, and then England, uh, after World War One, when they practically starved to death because you know the U-boats were sinking wheat ships from Kansas uh, every day, uh, going across to Britain uh, in their quest in order to figure out how to better feed their country, uh, they they were frustrated because. In, in one year a variety would look really good and the next year it would be horrible and they there was they knew that something was wrong and so they they had a person at Rothamsted his name was uh, R.L. Fisher uh, and he was an exceptional mathematician as well as a plant breeder and they asked him they tasked him to figure out a method of statistics that they could use so that with confidence they could find answers to their production questions. And so he developed uh, the system of statistics that we use today, um, the um, agricultural statistics. And replication is the cornerstone of all of that. If you don't have that, you don't know what's happening. All right. So you have everything you need. Uh, and so I think with... Uh, I don't know if the on-farm network at, at K-State will keep going after Carlos comes up to Fargo in May or not, but um, at least uh, some of you have some experience with it, and you know what I'm talking about. Uh, okay, time for a story, uh, because I have lots of time. I have a half-hour presentation and an hour to give it, so this is great. So uh, I got a call from Northwest, a farmer from Northwest Minnesota, or Minnesota, North Dakota this year. Uh, after harvest time, and and uh, he said that that he had been approached the winter before uh, about five different products that had some interest to him. Two were foliar applied products, uh, and three were were pre plant products. One was a biological, as I recall. And so he remembered that I had talked about this somewhere sometime, and so he decided that he was going to test them. 
So he put replicated uh, strips in his field. Uh, one field with one product, another field with another, another field with another. And I marveled because this spring was horrible up in North Dakota because it was such a late spring. A lot of people didn't get in the field until late May. And then in Northwest North Dakota was even worse because they have such a horrible short growing season up there near Canada. Uh, but still, he took the time to do it. So he took the time to do it, uh, and then he took the time to harvest it. And with the yield monitor, of course, it's 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 easy to extract the data from your from your data set with your GPS. And so he said he he analyzed it, and then he said, "I'm just so frustrated." And I said, "Why?" And I said, "Well, because." None of the five products that I tested were any better than what I was doing already. And I just started laughing. And he said, why are you laughing? And, he, and I said, because do you have any idea how many thousands of dollars you saved? You know, well over $100,000 by not using these things. And, and now you know that they're not really going to have any value for you. So you won't use them in the future as well. And he thought, he said, well, I guess you're right. So, yeah, when you replicate this and test it, then you'll know. So that's that's the way to approach all these things. All right, so let's see. Why isn't it working? Why isn't this working? Oh, maybe I have to do this somehow. There we go. All right, so one of the great things about being the first author on this circular with the my nine other, 10, ten other colleagues is that is that I got a lot of phone calls. I had a lot of, you know, I had some, quite a few phone calls from startup biological companies. Uh, and one of them was from the UK, five of them for, for California. Uh, and so we got to talk about things because as one of the person described, I asked him why he's calling me and he said, well, we want to avoid a train wreck. So these are things we talked about and, and I think after all the phone calls and the Zoom interviews and that kind of stuff, uh, these are things we kind of landed on. One was there needs to be some kind of a quick method of analysis to determine whether the organism is alive and functioning uh, in the container that you buy it in or the field or the plant, depending on where it's supposed to be working. And, and it's not a real trivial thing, but I think it's doable. I think there's enough, there's enough methodology now in biotech and in uh, the microorganism uh, biological community that this could happen if there was a will by the company to make it happen. But without that, you don't even know if if anything's happening out there or not. So I think there needs to be some kind of a quick method to analyze it. So that's a question to ask somebody when they approach you about some kind of biological product. Okay, this next one is not very trivial either. So the organisms need to be kept alive through transport and storage in alveoles between manufacturer, shipper, warehouses, distributor, dealer, and on the farm uh, before application. And I just, I took a picture of the two products that we used in, in North Dakota. One was Invita, one was Utricia. Uh, but these are the, the store uh, storage in, in handling directions. And I don't know which is which. You just have to look at the label to see. <clears throat> But the one product says store at room temperature and don't subject to prep temperatures below 39 degrees. And then the second product is very specific store between 39 degrees and 46 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, that doesn't sound like room temperature to me. Uh, so, you know, what if you have multiple products and they have multiple storage temperatures? This is this is kind of an issue. So. Uh, this is a particular interest to the company that that I zoomed with in the UK. They had the money behind the project on the call. They had the lead scientist, and they had three postdocs. and And the one postdoc uh, said they know that the organism is alive when it leaves the assembly line, but then after that, you know, they really don't know. And so, if you do have of uh, some restrictions of re refrigeration, the product needs to be refrigerated at, within that temperature range from the moment that it is put into a container to the moment when it gets to the field and injected into the soil or onto the plant. 
Uh, and so a person needs to ask, so, you know, are the trucks climate controlled? Do the warehouse area where this is stored, do they have a climate controlled area? Uh, the distributor, uh, do they have a section that's climate controlled? Does the dealer have a section that's climate controlled? Uh, this is my second career, and I came out of the retail fertilizer industry uh, originally, and, and certainly the outfit I worked for didn't have something like that. Maybe they do. I've been out of it for 30 years. And then once it gets to the farm, a farmer comes in, he says, you know, okay, I need my 10,000 acres of product X. And then they take it back, and they intend to to apply it within the next week or so. Uh, but then they get rained down and it's two, three weeks before they actually get it on the field or they have some place to store it where it'll stay alive. So person has to think about this whole, this whole logistic train. All right. So that's the next thing. So point number five is I think when these products are tested in their original state, so they know how much nitrogen they're really producing, uh, they're in more or less a sterile environment and really aren't in, an, in a situation where they have to compete with anything. But when you stick these things into the soil, for example, uh, either as a seed treatment or uh, in a band with the seed, uh, I mentioned the food source they have, the root, the root slime. There's, there's thousands of organisms living on that thing already. So they're going to vigorously defend their territory. And so do the organisms that you're introducing into this environment, do they have the ability to compete and win with those native microorganisms? And I, I don't think that's a very trivial thing. So that's another question. How competitive are these? And then... I think maybe our soils are a little bit more variable than what you have, but I'll leave that up to you to decide if they are or not. So in North Dakota, we have we have soils that are sandy and we have soils that are high clay. We have soils that are droughty and we have soils that are very wet. We have soils that are have real high pH, 7.5 to 82, and we have soils that are pH of 5 or below. Uh, and we have soils that have salts, soluble salts, significant soluble salts, and soils that don't, a few that don't. And so if you're, and, and, and we have, and we have fields uh, like a quarter section, and there are many quarter sections that have every one of those, every one of those conditions that I just mentioned in the same quarter section. So if you're buying an organism and applying it on the field, is it adapted to all those variable moisture, pH, salt, uh, and other soil conditions in order to perform its function? And I think that's a valid question. So there's my contact information. And